Have you had that special dog or dogs in your life that just seemed to have changed everything for you? For me, it was a dog named Cody and without whom this show probably would not have existed. For my guest today, it was another Cody that started him on a journey that had him quitting his job as a lawyer, writing a book, and creating a dog food, all because he found out about a silent killer that affects about 43 million dogs, shortening their lives and taking them away from us too soon. Intrigued? Stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Missy. Has anyone ever told you that your dog is too fat? Suggested that maybe you're loving them to death and then gives you no way to fix something so terrible? Well, that's what happened to today's guest, Daniel Shuloff, the founder of Keto Natural Pet Foods and the author of the book we'll be talking about today, Dogs, Dog Food, and Dogma. So without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome Daniel. Welcome, Dan. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it is wonderful to have you here. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about your book, Dogs, Dog Food, and Dogma. And I was wondering, before we get started, can you tell me, do you still have Cody, who was kind of the catalyst for all of this? I don't. No, I don't, oh. unfortunately. Um, yeah, he, uh, he lived a long and healthy life. Um, but he passed away in February pretty recently at 14, which is very old for Rottweiler, I'll note. But yeah, that was a very difficult uh, experience for me. He was my, I grew up with dogs. My mother was a dog lover, is a dog lover. And um, so I, you know, I've been around dogs all my life, but Cody uh, was the first dog that I was ever personally responsible for. I got him when I was a, a young adult. And he is kind of, as I, the story I tell in the book, he's, my relationship with him and becoming a pet owner and trying to wrestle with what that means, what, what my responsibilities are, um, is what led me to become a dog food person, become somebody that wrote a book about this stuff and become somebody, you know, left my old career and started that and started my, my company. And all that was kind of based on uh, my relationship with him. He's a wonderful dog, but no, he's gone now. And um, we, what I, I do share my home with three dogs though, at, at the moment. <laughs> I have, um, so my girlfriend and I who live together, um, kind of, you know, the Brady Bunch? Yeah. We Brady Bunch together a couple. <laughs> and uh, so we had Cody and Nash on my side. Nash is a adult male St. Bernard. He's a big boy. Yeah. And, um, she has, she comes from, she's a professional dog person too. She works in animal welfare. She works for a, like a shelter dog organization that has a national presence. And so it. she's got a couple of dogs that she came through professionally and has gotten to know. Uh, and so, yeah, we got three of us now, three of them now. So who are, so you've got Nash, yep. you've got. Nash. And then on the other side, Lexi's dogs are Molly and Kaya. Kaya, and, and they're out for a walk right now. So it might entirely be the case that during this show, you can <laughs> see them come in. So we'll point them out. But Kaya is the interesting one. Molly is a lovely house pet and a great little dog. Kaya is interesting. She um, looks like a husky, uh, sort of, but she's got a slinky look and uh, kind of like an upturned snout and forward ears. And Lexi long suspected that she had wolf in her. As wow. your listeners probably know, there's a lot of like dogs and wolves are one of very few species that are so genetically similar that they can breed with one another and make offspring. And so they do. And there's, there's you know, by yeah. some people's estimates, half a million of them in the U.S. And apparently Kai is one of them because the genetic thing that she sent off uh, said 30% wolf. So I got a 30% wolf in my house too. Wow. That's, yep. uh, um, yeah, I hear that, that wolf hybrids are challenging. So I'm glad that you're on the, the lower end of, <laughs> of that. No, 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 I'm not. Uh, you, yes, she, she just has some wolf like, in there somewhere. <laughs> not, it's funny though. My, you know, I like, I just kind of assumed like, oh, the main, main thing you'd notice from a dog wolf hybrid kind of behaviorally or psychologically is some form of kind of aggression and wildness. And she has zero aggression, absolutely none of it. But she's just not, she is like wild. Like her, her willingness to like, like her, she'll break out of the fence. Like she leaves, like runs away, 
you know, she is not is inclined to listen to people and she's she's a, she's a, is definitely a handful but she's not mean she's a sweet dog independent independent that's a good yeah. point that's well said yeah. yeah it's there it's they don't have that baby quality that <laughs> yeah, dogs not, have that not need. helpless on their own yeah she's, no i can manage this on my own i do not need you yeah <laughs> so let's go back for a second. So this book started with your journey with Cody. So he was, a, um, you were a bachelor, you yeah. had decided you wanted a companion, you ended up getting a Rottweiler. And you're a pretty athletic guy, right? You run, uh, yeah. are, you tri are you a triathlete? You run marathons? I've done Ironman triathlons. I, I live in the state of Utah now. Uh -huh. And we live right at the foot of the Wasatch Range, big mountain range. And so mostly my stuff is in the mountains these days, which means I do like these ultra distance trail races. So, you know, go up in the mountains and travel a hundred miles, like, you know, nonstop. And so it's a big, big, long athletic stuff. Yeah. So you were, so Cody was pretty athletic and fit also. And yeah. it was... The book came about because you were looking for a way to take Cody to the next level? Uh, sort of. So like, have you ever had um, or known in your life any Rottweilers? Yeah. Like, yeah. So, so, I mean, you know, and I'm sure your listeners know, like they can be intense. You know, he's, he, Cody was like very much uh, prototypical Rottweiler where he had heavy protective instincts, big, muscular, strong dog, just a lot of like, energy. And so exercising him, I came to learn, I guess everybody knows this at this point, it was a really good way to manage his less desirable behavioral tendencies and make him like a polite member of society. And so I basically became very interested in trying to do that. Well, at, the, at this time, when I got him, I was working a really demanding job as an attorney working in this big law firm. And it was just like trying to understand how to exercise him most effectively. What does that even mean? Do I want something that he really enjoys? Do I want to develop his muscles? Do I just want him to be? And that kind of process became like, we were never competing in athletics for him. You know, yeah. like I wasn't designed with maximizing his fitness for that, but I did want, I did have specific goals that I wanted to like try to achieve. And so I, I had to try to figure out how to do that. And at that point, you had gotten to Dr. Ernie Ward's website, right? Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah, that's right. I haven't, you know, I haven't heard much from Dr. Ward over the past few years. But yes, that is that is basically how I found uh, the issue of, of stumbled upon the issue of obesity among pets in the uh, Western world. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Ward, for those of your listeners who don't know, is a vet who at, at the time, I think still lives in North Carolina. And um, he was the founder and kind of the principal for an organization called the Association for Pet Obesity Prevention, which to my knowledge still is an operating thing. It's a 501c3 nonprofit organization that basically was just like drawing attention to this issue, to the issue of obesity in pets and why it's a big deal and why we should all be paying attention to it. So what had happened was, and, and it's funny because almost all of us who've had a journey that starts with a dog or, or even ourselves, you know, I ha actually had a dog named Cody um, too, with a C, not a K. <laughs> okay. And um, he had, uh, at age eight, he was diagnosed with cancer. So that kind of started um, me on this journey of what can I do to help him? Because there was a very finite, a box of things that conventional med medicine could offer me. So what I found really intriguing about your journey is you're just looking for a way to, you know, keep your dog healthy and happy. And you stumble on a website, this APOP website, right, with Dr. Ernie Ward. And basically you find information that says what? That there's a silent epidemic taking our pets much sooner than they should allowing chronic diseases that we maybe think of as normal, like cancer and um, diabetes and arthritis and these age-related, these things that we think of as normal, yeah. they, this website actually tells says to you, it's not normal. It's because your dog, because our dogs are overweight and being overweight is allowing these other things to manifest. And then you find out what, that your very fit dog is. 
overweight? Yeah, that he was like overweight. That by the the like standards used through the APOP website and in the broader veterinary community, that he would be considered overweight. And it like never crossed my mind. By that at that point in my life, I was very fit. I was trying to exercise him a lot. But um, you know, you're, you, you might be familiar. Basically, the way that the veterinary community very sensibly like looks at whether a dog is overweight or obese or like a good body condition is you can't do this. You know, in people, it's an imprecise measure, right? But we typically just like weigh ourselves, and that's right. a reasonably good proxy for like how overweight you are. Um, I mean, it's called overweight, but um, in dogs, that doesn't work, right? Because you know, Nash, my St. Bernard is 130, 40 pounds, huge, right? Yeah. And then there are dogs that are 13, 14 pounds. There's literally an order of magnitude difference between them and Nash. Ten, he's 10 times as large as them. Right. And so the idea of just being like, ah, the correct weight is this, is, um, is almost impossible. And now that's not to say it's not in some corners of the world, that's still a really popular thing in like breed standards, the AKC's breed standards for different breeds. There are statements for how much the, you know, various breeds ought to weigh, but none of those are evidence-based. Those are just like people that know that breed really well saying, this is what we think. There's absolutely no evidence that says like this, this weight is the right weight for this breed, meaning it's the healthiest weight for this breed. That's not something that exists. Right. What does exist are these things called body condition scoring charts. And so they're meant to like measure obesity or, or body fat um, without having to weigh the animal. And so instead what you do is you basically look for specific parts of the body and you try to match up how it looks to you or feels with uh, specific descriptions. So things like how visible are is the rib, rib cage or like, there's the abdominal tuck. Like if you look at a dog uh, sideways in profile, that upsloping area from like the big ribs up to like kind of the midsection, how that looks. And they give you silhouette. There's a few different ones. They give you little silhouettes and things like that. So you can match it up. But yeah, using that as the like standard, it was like, oh my God, <laughs> okay. And if I'm allowing my dog, you know, I'm run a hundred miles and my dog is super serious. I'm a very type A person. Like if I'm letting this happen, lots of, this is a big thing. And APOP was really clear, you know, like they have the, the facts about the prevalence and the seriousness of obesity among pets punch super hard and like as they are right now. So it's like, they're kind of two main ones. One is overweight and obesity is so prevalent that it is the norm. It's like if you, there are 70 plus million dogs and cats in the United States. If you go out onto the street right now and you just pick the next dog that comes by, you are more likely to find that that dog is overweight or obese than appropriate body condition. It's like, it's, it is the norm now. And then the other second, the second fact that punches really hard is that when you look at the impacts, there's, there's kind of been a few studies, but one really important one has been done on the issue of how obesity impacts disease and lifespan in dogs. And basically what these folks did, well, really well-funded team of researchers took a, two different, or two groups of puppies from a few different litters. They matched them up by litter and they just followed them over the entire lifespan of every dog in the study. So more than a decade worth of work. And they just basically made one group fat and the other, and the other group not. And when I say fat, I don't mean like colossally obese where everybody, no matter how familiar you are with the issue of obesity in dogs, like everybody's like, oh, that dog is clearly a oh, that poor dog. I mean, just like moderately overweight, something like I had allowed my dog to become. That was one group. And then the other group was leaner. And basically what they found is that in almost every single case, the obese dogs live considerably shorter lives than the lean ones to such a degree that like, unfortunately, as you know, uh, you know, as I've recently experienced firsthand, dogs live really short lives, much shorter lives than we live. But on a percentage basis, being moderately overweight is worse for a dog than smoking your entire life is for a human being. Like the amount, it will impact your dog's lifespan negatively. So like more than half the dogs in the country, so the average dog in the country is overweight and being overweight is worse for a dog than a lifetime of smoking. And it's just like, what? How can that be a thing? And yeah. then 
pet owners are talking about anything else. Because to me, it was just like, I mean, I struggle to sometimes, you know, I, I'm a very active person, but like I, I, losing weight is not easy because for me, because it involves things like willpower and trying to having to say no to like things that I know are delicious or being motivated to go exercise or whatever. But like, I thought when I learned about all this, it's like with dogs, like you are controlling what the dog eats, how much it eats. This should be the easiest thing in the world. Sure. Some people might like not appreciate how bad it is or might screw up the amount they're feeding and make the occasional, but like the average dog and, um, yeah, and the and the conventional wisdom as expressed by APOP, but as I'd later come to find out, like in every major veterinary textbook, the conventional wisdom is pet owners are just loving our pets to death. That's the, the, the phrase you hear all the time. And it's just like, we are either, you know, A, too stupid to appreciate that obesity is a serious thing. Like as if there's anybody in the, in the Western world right now who doesn't know at this point that it's bad for your dog. Um, or we're too weak willed, right? We like dog bags and we're just like, can't do it. Here's the ice cream, you know, can't, can't stop myself um, to such, again, to, to every day to such a degree that the animal becomes, or that we're too lazy. That like, if only we would exercise or give our dogs exercise, they'd all be perfectly lean. And it's all, so basically it's like your fault, like your fault, you're a bad pet owner. And that just, to me, reading that was like, no, that's that. There's just no way that doesn't pass the smell test. There's got to be more to that story, and that's sort of like that began a four-year project that ultimately turned into the book. I what I find so amazing about that is it, is it's like you were the right person to find yeah. that right information at that time because there are so many people who would come who have probably come across that website and. It took something completely different from that. But what you decided to do was be like, wait a minute, this is one website. They're saying this, I need, you know, and I think it's your law background that really, really helped you with that a hundred percent, which is you, you're used to dealing with these facts and then picking them apart to make sure that they're actually what they say they are, you know? And I think for all of us and uh, you know, this book is all of that picking apart. So where did you go next after taking a look at the website, trying to find um, some more information and coming up blank? What, where did you go next? Yeah, so I basically like, at first I was like, this, this information will be useful for me in raising my dog and that's why I wanna understand it. There's a story here and it's piquing my interest personally, you know, for the reasons you said, like, I mean, it's like, maybe there's a personality attribute, maybe it's how my personality had developed by virtue of the work that I had done in my life until then. But whatever it was, it was like, oh, this might not be the right answer for me with my dog. Let me look more into this and try to figure out the better answer for what he needs. And then as I did go into it, it became clear like, oh, there's an untold story here. You know, you and I were talking before we began recording about how common diet books, human nutritional science books, like are in the human domain, you know, dozens every year, hundreds, like on the issues that I cover in my book, mainly like obesity, hundreds every year. And the number of books that anybody had written in the pet space, kind of the analogous books in the doggy world were just like very few. And the problem was huge. And it was just like, you know, I could put together some, this is like, I began to kind of think of myself as like, you know, maybe I do have enough knowledge here to like, right, it doesn't look like anybody else is reporting this. Maybe I need to like put this together into a public format. Like I, it was the era of eBooks it was just beginning kind of. And it was like, I could, I could do this. I could put this together into a quality. I, I write professionally. I'm a lawyer. Like that's basically what you do as a lawyer. You just write all the time. It's like, I could do this. I could write this and people would find this valuable. And so then it kind of became that scale of project where it was like, I'm going to look at what all the studies say, and I'm going to break it down for people and show what the evidence really says, because a lot of these places aren't covering all the relevant evidence. And then like, as I got into that, like one of the, when I was thinking about the project from that kind of scale, eventually I got deeper into it and it was like, oh no, that's not enough. Like there needs to be, I need to write the definitive, there's an issue here that's broader than just like, nobody's written a book about the relevant science and oh, here it is. It's like, no, there's a reason for that. There's like, not just 
uh, you know, there's evidence that's getting ignored and I got to call attention to it, but also why? Like, what's the story here? We, we all love our pets. We've all, nobody, there's never been a time in human history where we've spent more money on them. There's never been a time where there's more veterinarians than there are now. Right. And yet like this stuff that's basic, these like this whole big body of evidence is just getting ignored. And um, it was like fascinating to me. And so it was like kind of burn down the project multiple times and start again with bigger ambitions for it. And so the, the form that it ultimately took, you know, where it's a 400 page book right. was kind of like, um, I've got to do, I, it's not just enough to read studies and tell people what the studies say. I have to do firsthand reporting, which means like, I got to go places like veterinary schools and talk to biologists, go into dog food factories, go to like the places where the story is, is taking place. Yeah. And so that's when I was like, okay, I, I need to leave my job if I'm going to do this. And, um, I ultimately did do that. And so, yeah, the, the book is kind of, like you said, it's a, it's a person, it's like written in a style where I'm like, a, I'm part of the story. It's me trying to understand this issue and the reader falls along with it. And so it, it catalogs the different places that I went to try to understand this story. And yeah. what, what makes the most sense to me, the first place I go in the book, it's not chronologically like exactly how it all took place, but the, the place that, to start the thinking about it is with wolves. Yeah. And so, and, and the reason for that is that like, you know, we were I was mentioning before, dogs and wolves are this like really rare thing in the world of biology, which is that there are two species that are separate species, but they're so like, usually if you ask a biologist, how do you tell one species from another? What makes, where's the line between a walrus and a, you know, chimpanzee, something like that. And the, the easiest like back of envelope way that they talk about it is like, you can't breathe. Like you can't, a walrus and a chimpanzee can't make a baby together. You know, that's the difference. It's like two species can't do that. Well, dogs and wolves are two species, but they're so similar that they can. And they're one of like almost, they're like literally one of the only species, like pair of species that can do that. And that's really relevant in our case, in the case of trying to understand why, what like the, the health of dogs in the Western world is like, because wolves, unlike dogs, don't have chronic disease problems. Wolves raised in the wild or raised in captivity in wild type settings, uh, you know, wh where their lifestyle is, you know, shaped for them by professionals, zoo folks who kind of like try to give them a, a life like they live in the wild, get 0.0% obesity, don't get the other chronic diseases, etc. And so I was like, okay, well, I got to understand the wolf side of this. And it's cool because like there are really high level wolf biologists, some of the best in the world operating in the United States, particularly in the American West at Yellowstone National Park. And so I went to the, um, the what's called the Yellowstone Wolf Project, where they have a cluster of biologists who study wolves incredibly closely. And I lived with them for a period. That's cool. And you found out that wolves, um, so one of the, so I'm a raw feeder. Uh, have been for a while. And um, I, I, when I first started, there were things that people would say about raw feeding because people were trying to put it together based on what wolves did. But what you found was pretty interesting that wolves, and correct me if I'm wrong, so wolves mainly eat protein. Um, they, when they make a kill, they'll go for the internal organs, the kidney, the liver, the spleen, the heart first, because they contain the most nutrients. Then they go for the, um, skeletal musculature. So the, the, your muscles, then they go for the softer bones, like the ribs and that type of bone in the body. They eat the hide. But what they leave is the intestinal tract with all that pre-digested vegetable matter that everybody who feeds raw is trying to kind of duplicate to a point. Um, and they also leave the harder bones, you know, because they don't have a butcher that cook, cuts them up really nice, like, <laughs> like our, our butcher does for our dogs. But is that the basic um, meal plan for a wolf? Yeah, so that's, I mean, it's just, yeah, and so, and you've got it basically exactly right. Um, when you, there are a few different species of wolves. The one that's really, really close, really genetically similar to the domestic dog is the gray wolf. 
and they are in the United States present in a few places. And they're reasonably like opportunistic animals that will, if you, you know, have a pack of wolves that lives near a garbage dump, they'll find ways to draw nutrition out of the food that's in the garbage dump. But in the wild, in the American West, all the only thing that wolves eat, for, they, not the only thing, 99% of what wolves eat are ungulates, these kind of like large class of animals that includes things like elk and moose. And you've got basically how they tend to pick through each kill about exactly right. They, you know, I don't know about it as a matter of sequencing, but like a thing you hear all the time amongst uh, wolf biologists is like the delicacy for wolves. Like the very first thing is like an unborn like fetus, basically like the, the if there's like a gestating um, uh, elk or something like that, that's like the, the thing. But like you said, also the like the other kind of very like system specific internal organs, like you said, kidneys, um, things like that. They're all like, unlike skeletal muscle tissue, they're all packed with like a whole variety of like the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals that can be somewhat rarer in the skeletal muscle tissue. And so those things, they developed the sense of that over eons of evolution. And now kind of that's, that's where it starts because that stuff's nutritionally valuable for them. And then, yeah, basically when you get to a wolf kill that's been there for long enough time that it's basically, it's all over. Um, you got two things left. And so one are the big, like you said, the bones that are just too large for, you know, big like pelvis bone or whatever the equivalent of a pelvis is in a moose, huge and not a wolf can't do it. And then the other thing is just like a little bit of a nuance from what you said, you said the, um, they leave the intestinal tract and that's actually not even it. It's like they, they eat the tract. They eat the, all of the lining, the lining of the, the thing's stomach. What they don't eat is the contents of it. So oh. if, you're a, if you're a moose or an elk, you eat plants and plants only, right? They don't eat any, they don't just like occasionally eat a squirrel or something like that. All they eat is plants and their digestive infrastructure has evolved to address that. And so digesting plant material is something that like, um, it's, it requires specific um, like infrastructure, specific parts. And they've got this thing called a, a digestive organ called a rumen. And the rumen, that's why they're called rumula, uh, ruminants. Um, and basically what it is, is like all of the plant material goes in there in huge quantities and it basically ferments in there and like sp spends a long time in there and gets broken down. Oh. So when you get to a wolf kill, you've got like these big bones and that's, and then you've got the contents of the room and these like wads of plant material. They literally eat the lining around it, but leave the big wad of plants. Wow. Uh, and so, yeah, I've seen, I think I've heard you, I think you were referring to like, there's a, a, a belief that some folks have that um, wolves actually are consuming a fair amount of plant material because they're killing animals that eat plants. And so they're eating plant material. That is categorically wrong. That is categorically wrong. That is not something of which there's any evidence whatsoever. Gray wolves do not do that. And in fact, it's like you can, not only is that true just by, if you talk to the folks who study their ecology, who like go out in the field and watch what they actually do, but there's a, like, a, you can look at it from a matter of physiology as well, just how the animal's body parts work. A wolf, so there are kind of two ways, genetically speaking, that wolves and dogs are different. And so one is the one that I was highlighting before when I was telling you about our dog, like the, the brain and the way it causes them to behave. It's mm -hmm. quite different, you know, like basically dogs have become domesticable where they are, they pay attention and care more about and, and a million other things within the brain like that, that when scientists have basically stacked up the genome of the domestic dog and the genome of the gray wolf, they go, aha, this is one place where things are not the same in the brain. The other place concerns the digestive material that's needed to digest plant matter, digest carbohydrate. And there's a, a, um, an enzyme. Enzymes are used to like break stuff down. Digestive enzymes basically like help break stuff down that you, that you eat. And so you, me, and our dogs all produce this digestive enzyme called amylase. And amylase is found in the uh, saliva of both dogs and human beings. And 
it is, how do I say this? It's like, if you take a piece of bread and you put, just take a little piece of bread and put it in your mouth and hold it in there for a few, like for 30 seconds or something like that, it'll start to taste sweet. Yeah. What that is, is amylase working on the bread. It's taking the molecules of starch that of the, that it's like a, this long complex carbohydrate that, that makes up bread and breaking those down into individual molecules of glucose, which is sugar. It's like what these long chains of carbohydrate are composed of is just little individual molecules of sugar. Amylase breaks it down. And that's why it starts to turn the bread into sugar in your mouth. Your dog does the same thing. And like, that's why they can digest carbohydrate. Wolves don't make it. So like for them, it's like literally impossible to digest carbohydrate. They don't like, that's not, that's just not a part of their diet. And it's clearly demonstrable. No. Um, so I forget how I got going on. No, that. yeah, that, that's, but that's, that's ex it. When you read this book, that's exactly where you go. It's like, my mind went a hundred different places. You know, I've got to read this study. I've got to look at that. Oh, wasn't this interesting? You know, uh, oh, this kind of validates this. This is something I've seen, but I hadn't never taken the time to explore the why of it, you know? Um, and uh, what I found really interesting, well, one side note, is, you know, when people talk about dogs being able to digest carbohydrates, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And if you are, I don't even know what discipline would do it, but if you're, if you're studying dinosaur or, or fossils, you're going to figure out what, a, what an animal ate by its tooth structure. We and just like ruminants have nice flat surfaces. We have some tearing surfaces but dogs don't dogs teeth are still just like the yep. wolves teeth. Yep. They, they don't have those crushing surfaces. They have ripping, tearing surfaces. Right. So, you know, right there, I always felt like it leaned a little bit more towards, you know, the wild side, as opposed to the, uh, I can eat, you know, there's, um, other, cereal stuff. Grains. there's other stuff. It's like, Dog, or and excuse me, species that are basically adapted for carnivory, for like eating other animals, their eyes and ears tend to be structured in certain kinds of ways. They're forward facing and narrow together so that they can like you with like have a great deal of precision with how they like can and see and like the, the ears are forward facing. Um, whereas like animals, like if you think of uh, a cow or an elk, a horse, it's a closer to the outside of the head because the real ad advantage for them is getting a big wide range of yeah. visual stuff. They need to be able to see if another like a predator is coming in. Right. So they, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff that basically reflects eons and eons of evolution shaping the genome into the most um, adaptive structure it can be in given its environment. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's different about them. Yeah, I loved, I loved that. I, I was like, oh, this is just so interesting. And then there are a couple other things I really found interesting. So can you remind me how much does a wolf eat in a day? If oh, Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's an interesting fact. So like the expression wolf it down comes from uh, the fact that obviously that wolves eat a lot. And it's not that they, I mean, they're, they're some, somewhat larger than many types of dogs, but they're not like it's not complete. It's not, uh, we're not talking about grizzly bears. They're just somewhat larger, but, um, so the daily, if you average it out, the daily intake between a dog that's the same size as a wolf and a wolf itself is not that different as a matter of calories. Right. But what's different is the frequency. So wolves are kind of feast or famine type eaters. Like most of us, at least what's so common in, in, in America to feed your dog on a regular schedule at least once a day in all likelihood more than once a day yeah that is not how wolves eat wolves eat like once every seven 10 14 days they go like long periods of time a week or more between big kills big huh. feasts and when they do eat they eat as much as 10 percent of their body weight in one meal so for you know for me it's 18 pounds of food all at one meal, you know, it's uh, whatever, 18 times four quarter pounders, uh, 80 quarter pounders in one meal. That's and crazy. Um, yeah, it's absurd. It's, it's amazing. Um, and that's just kind of how they've, uh, that's, that's typical, right? It's hard to bring down right. a, a big piece of a big prey. And uh, in the wild, it goes quick. It's like, you got to eat that quick because there's your, there's scavengers out there. There are other predators. They're going to get wind of it. Um, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, they eat a lot. And even though they do eat a lot, 
Um, I believe in your book, you talked about the fact that even wolves that live in areas where food is plentiful, that wolves kind of maintain an obesity rate because that's where your quest started with, with obesity, an obesity rate of between what, 10, seven to 10%. Oh, I said that wrong though. I meant, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. You got the right idea. <laughs> know, the, yeah. body, the body fat percentage right. is like seven to 10%, like across the board, folks have done really interesting studies of like all kinds of species where they just look at the body composition, what percentage of the tissue is fat versus other stuff. And yeah, in the case of gray wolves, both in captivity and in the wild tend to have less than 10% body fat. Yeah. And where do our dogs fall with that? Um, just like the average dog, what did you find? Yeah, it's north of 30%. So it's like, um, you know, again, the average dog, you have to extrapolate a little bit because um, like I said, the way that we tend to think about that the like, veterinary community thinks about obesity in dogs and cats is by the like the body comp or body uh, condition charts that I was telling you about before, right. where we kind of were like, okay, we, this part feels this way or this part looks this way. But the way that those things came into being is folks came up with that, like some scientists drew them up as a theoretical matter. They're like, this probably would work well to help us understand how much fat's really in this dog. And then they did studies where they said, okay, what percentage, um, of actual body fat applies to a dog in this level of our body condition scoring chart. What percentage fat? So anyway, if you extrapolate from those things, you find that obesity or like overweight, what we think of as overweight is typically around 25% or more for a dog. And wow. that obese is like 30% or more. Yeah. And I forget the specific number off the top of my head, but it's basically like, you know, it's you're talking about three or four times as much fat in the average dog as in the average wolf. Right. And the kind of like, that's incredibly rare in the animal kingdom. Like, and like there's only kind of a few other places where you ever, ever see animals get that fat. And it's like, number one, human beings, of course, like plenty of us are overweight or obese too. And you see body compositions get up into that kind of height or like animals that are so-called like functionally fat. So like when a grizzly bear is gonna hibernate for a long period of time, a bunch of stuff hormonally takes place that causes that animal to like pack on the pounds before hibernation so that when it's asleep for an entire season, it's got stuff to draw on. Or some animals live like in very, very cold environments all the time, so like a walrus or like a whale, like a blue yeah. whale. As, and so that's the other, like the only other place besides obesity, which you really only find in human beings, where you see an animal that's as fat as an average dog is like a whale, is a blue whale. Like our dogs are as fat as whales on Baby average. Baby whales, <laughs> percentage <laughs> wise. Well, we're in now, that's where, that's where we're yeah. at. But we're not even talking, and just, just to kind of remind people, we're not even talking about what you would really and truly consider obese. I mean, you're talking about a dog that you would probably think kind of like Cody was, think that was just fine, just normal yeah. fit, able to, able to run, play, jump, ha be in what you considered healthy and what you are finding out and what starts this journey is that you're finding out that what we think of as normal is actually heavier than it really should be for our dog's health in the long term. That's right. It's like, you know, there are, um, those body condition scoring charts are, don't reflect the lay public's understanding of what's optimal for their dog, in, in my experience. You know, for instance, if you tune into the Westminster Kennel Club dog show, the animals that tend to win their breeds in just about all cases, particularly with like large breeds, end up being not just like a little, like they're pretty noticeably way overweight and they're considered the best representative of that breed by the folks who, who kind of know the breed standard very well, which is a pretty glaring example to me of how we've normalized a, a particular fat body, body condition. Wow, and um, so when you're looking at it, when you're saying they're overweight, you're saying that compared to this body conditioning score probably are overweight to some degree. So you getting on, there's like, there's kind of my book. I tried to do a few things with the book, but there's kind of two scientific theses. There's like a big investigative part of it, which is just like, why, you know, I'm in mean, with the wolf biologist or I'm in the vet school yeah. talking to the people about why we think what we think. 
But as far as like substantive scientific theories put, that I'm pushing in the book that I think are persuasive, number one is carbs make you fat. And we'll yeah. get, I'm sure we'll get to that. Yeah. And then the other is on this. And this makes up a huge chunk of the book, but it's like kind of, it's drier and it's more academic. Um, just like how, what is too fat? How do we know what is too fat? What is optimal? And how should we think about that when it comes to our dogs? And what's the real answer there? And that makes up like a huge chunk of the book because it's, it's an interesting topic to me and I was writing the book. Um, but it tends to be less interesting to the public because it's like, look, we know that by anybody's veterinary definition, that the majority of dogs are too fat. So like just the issue, the actionable thing is it's too fat, start doing something about it. Like what's truly optimal is like, oh, we can get there. Let's, let's deal with the 30 million dogs that we already know are, that everybody agrees are too fat right off the bat. But all that said, for my money, according to the evidence in my view, and you know, this is just my professional interpretation of it, I think that even these body condition scoring charts that you see in the veterinary office, that they basically imply that there's a U-shaped curve that, uh, that, that expresses the relationship between health and fatness. That like at the one end of the spectrum, if you're very, very lean, it's bad for your health. And at the other end of the spectrum, if you're very, very fat, it's bad for your health. And that somewhere kind of in the middle is the happy medium optimal as a matter of health, get your dog there. And that's beyond that is too lean. And on the other side is too fat. I don't believe that that's what the evidence truly reflects. I think it's fine to use because it's like the vast majority of dogs are in the too fat area to begin with. And so it's like, let's get them there. Right. But really what the evidence shows for my money is that there's an upward sloping line that basically we all know too fat is bad for health, but really with a couple of small caveats, you just can't be too lean. If you're, as long as your dog isn't losing muscle mass or displaying a lack of energy or dealing with some specific circumstances in its life, like it's pregnant or it's battling a chronic disease like cancer. In every other case, it's just like the leaner, the better. You want your dog to live as long as possible? Super easy answer. Just keep it as lean as you possibly can without losing muscle and without making it lose energy. That will keep it alive. That's what the evidence says will keep it alive the longest. So that's my take on it. And it's like, I mean, you know, for, to give, let me give you another example. We were talking before about how wild canines like wolves tend to have seven to 10% body fat. Mm -hmm. That is way on the, on like a, the type of body condition scoring chart that's used by most veterinarians with like a U-shaped uh, pattern underneath it. Seven to 10% is way in the too lean. If a wolf came in seven to 10% to the average veterinarian's office that was hip to the issue of obesity, they'd be like, that dog's too lean, we need to fatten it up. And that is not what I believe the evidence reflects. Uh, I believe the evidence reflects something different, which is that like, you want it to be healthy, keep it lean, keep it super lean, just like a person. It's like we, you know, the paragons of optimal health are like Olympian athletes, right? And they're not just like, Apple, they're not, excuse me, they're not just like average, like, oh, no, that's a 40 year old man's body. It's like, no, they are very, very lean. Yeah, I think the same. I mean, it's, it's, it's abundantly clear to me that that's the same pattern that governs in, a, um, in dogs. Well, I found it really interesting. You were the first person to talk about, are they called adipokin kinds? Yeah. Um, yeah. So adipokine is like a, a, a fancy word for like, what comes out of fat tissue. And I'm not really the first person to talk like, so as we've gotten, as the scientific community has developed a better and better ability to like look at things down at the cellular level, um, it's come to understand that body fat is not just like an in inert tissue. It's like metabolically active stuff. There's always stuff going on with respect to fat tissue. And one of the things that it does is it secretes specific types of substances. And so they, the term for those things is adipokines and um, fat is technically adipose tissue. So adipokine is like a, a secretion. And basically the summary kind of way of looking at it is like those things tend to do bad things to you. That right. like, you're ten, think of it basically. I mean, again, I'm not, don't take this completely literally. That's not <laughs> toxic poison, but it's like, it's poisonous. It's like, that's kind of our best understanding of why being fat is bad among other reasons is like 
bad stuff's coming out of the fat. So the more fat, the more bad stuff. And that's sort of the, the logic. That's a big part of the, the logic behind like, okay, well, we want to minimize the amount of that fat stuff, right? Or the, that, that bad stuff. So let's minimize the amount of fat. That, well, and it also of- kind of goes back to, um, you know, the, uh, and we'll get on this in a minute, but when you are overweight, there, are t- there tend to be health conditions that are associated with it right. that all ha- tie back to inflammation. So it's those adipokines that you're saying are actually signaling that to happen. You have too many, it starts to become an issue for your body, your body's reaction to it or overreaction to it then kind of sets off this chain of reaction. Um, You know, Dr. Jason Fung talks about the fact that it's these chronic issues that cause cancers and these degenerative diseases. It's not these acute conditions that usually, you know, it's the everyday little things that we do to our bodies that actually impact us more in the long run than eating the cake one time because, you know, you've, you've felt like eating a cake. And it's so interesting how human and animals, you know, you know, as a woman, I've been on probably every diet out there. (laughs) And um, the next part of the book that I'd like to talk about is this calories in calories out, because the more, as I went through different diet plans, the more that I found with going to low carb is I didn't have to feel hungry. I, I was eating sometimes a lot more than I had been previously. And the only thing that I changed was the amount of carbohydrate and specifically carbohydrates that have a lot of starch or are higher on the glycemic index. And the glycemic index is what raises your blood sugar, which brings about insulin. So can you talk a little bit about what you found with the the calories in calories out and also about exercising our dogs uh, in how to bring about, can, oh, sure. does that really work? <laughs> yeah, sure. So calories in calories out um, for ages has been um, dogma or an article of faith in, uh, in the nutritional science community. It was that the way to think about gaining or losing weight is to think about the balance of calories. Or am I taking in more than I'm putting out? Um, <clears throat> And so the, the, the kind of most basic and simplistic way to deal with that reality for when it, you know, public health advocates say things like, okay, you've got to make sure that you're not taking in more than you're putting out. So you've either got to take in less food, take in fewer calories, or put out more energy, burn more calories. And that became the core of our um, like prescriptive model for how people should manage body condition or lose weight. But as the um, like scientific community got smarter and smarter and was able to understand things better and better, particularly over the 20th century and the end of the 20th century, they discovered that it, like that model is an oversimplification. So it is definitely true. Often you'll find um, yeah, this little bit of side note. In the human nutrition world, this uh, there are like diet wars among public facing oh, yeah. folks, right? Where there's just, there's a lot of emotional um, energy that folks put into their interpretation of what the science actually says about issues of body composition and weight loss. Interestingly, in the veterinary community, it doesn't look like that. There's such, it's just completely ignored on one side and you just can't even get people to a point where they're angry enough to fight. There's just no real discussion around it. Um, but anyway, so what, what, what they discovered is that basically like, let me take one step back. The problem with the calories in calories out view of the world is that it doesn't really explain the problem of obesity at an actionable level. It's like saying being poor is like taking in less money than you spend. And it's like, okay, y- yes, that is definitionally true. Being fat, is or gaining weight is taking in more calories than you spend, but it doesn't do anything to explain why people get poor. You don't just explain why poverty works by saying, well, people just need to take in more money than they spend. It's like, okay, well, that, that doesn't, that's not helpful. And basically the same kind of conceptual evolution has taken place in the nutrition community surrounding matters of obesity. Folks have increasingly tried to explain 
why people take in more calories than they burn. And it turns out, like you summarized in a really uh, um, cogent and clear way, that there's a specific type of calorie that has specific impacts on how the brain and the body tend to react to it. And that's carbohydrate. Digestible carbohydrate tends to do something that's particularly um, nefarious, particularly bad. We were talking before about how carbohydrate gets digested. So carbohydrates come in, this is, everybody knows, right? There's complex carbs, there's simple carbs, and then there's fiber. Fiber, indigestible fiber is a kind of carbohydrate as well, but um, they don't even get digested. They pass straight through the digestive tract and don't even get broken down. But all carbohydrates, complex, simple, fiber, what have you, they're all composed of chains at the very down at the like molecular level, they're chains of sugar, individual molecules of glucose, which is sugar, all put together. And so complex ones are like big chains with lots of glucose going off in different ways. Simple ones are very simple. They're just a couple of glucose molecules. But at the end of the day, it's the same like material down at the base of it. And the process of digesting carbohydrate is just the process of taking those big long chains and making them into individual glucose molecules. From here down into the stomach, basically that's what's happening is those molecules are all getting broken down. And that happens for a reason because the only way you can absorb that nutrition is in the form of glucose. And this, this all applies to your dog too. All this, the phys physiological nuts and bolts are all the same in dogs as they are in people. You don't absorb, the dog doesn't like absorb into its bloodstream a complex carbohydrate molecule. It swallows a complex carbohydrate molecule that gets broken down into glucose during digestion. And then what goes actually into the bloodstream is glucose. So when you eat a carbohydrate rich meal, or when your dog eats a carbohydrate rich meal, what happens after the meal is a bunch of glucose, one type of thing just floods into the bloodstream all at once, that one type of substance. And we know this because you can measure it. You can see it in people, you can see it in dogs. You can look at the blood and you can see how much sugar is in there at any given time. And you do this long enough and you can see the curve. Like if you do graph it over time, you can see dog eats a meal here, for the next 30, 45 minutes, depending on what it eats, the blood sugar level goes up really high. That's a problem because sugar, like glucose, if it's left in the blood for long enough, becomes toxic. It's bad, really bad. And it's like the, the condition, the like, uh, the, the lay condition that like the way people refer to it is a diabetic coma. It's like if your sugar is too high for too long, it will kill you. It's like that is toxic. You cannot tolerate it. But your body, and again, this applies all the same, I say your, but it's dogs and people both yeah. work the same way. They make this stuff called insulin that you referred to. And insulin, it's, it's a hormone that your pancreas make. And you make it to do basically to get the glucose out of the bloodstream. Like it's going to kill you if it stays there. So it's got to go somewhere. And insulin's job is to basically push it to places where it can live happily. Mm -hmm. And one of those places is fat tissue. So it's a long winded way of saying like, basically when you eat a carbohydrate rich meal, eat the carbs, blood glucose goes up, which makes insulin go up, which makes fat tissue suck up a bunch of stuff like sugar and makes the, the fat cells literally fatter. That's like in a definitional sense, that's what's happening. And so then what we experience, I, I've had the exact same experience that you've had where you're describing how you can eat more. If you do not eat carbohydrate, you can eat more without the feeling of hunger, without the feeling of wanting to eat. Right. Um, and that feeling, that emptiness feeling of wanting to eat, I always feel it. I don't always eat a keto, very low carb diet. And the reason that I don't do a particularly good job about that is I do these long endurance things where it's like, it's part of performance in that to eat carbs. And so I'm not just trying to optimize health. I, I care about, for stupid reasons, care about these athletics things. And so I eat carbs. And when I eat them, you can tell the morning, like when you wake up after having not eaten anything for eight hours and you are eating in the rhythm of eating carbohydrate, you want to eat in the morning. You feel hunger, your stomach turns out, like it does the yeah. grumbly stomach thing. If you get in a, a pattern of not eating carbohydrate and just eating fat and protein, you don't feel that in the morning. And it is like, that is a really tangible thing. And it's basically applies more broadly. 
you don't feel the same need like this absence where you need to eat and fill it up uh, if you don't eat carbohydrate. That's a result of the insulin kind of driving um, nutrients out of the bloodstream and into places like fat tissue. Yeah, yeah. And Which is a long-winded way of saying like, that's how, um, that's the physiology of why carbohydrates make you fat. It's like, basically they do it as a, um, uh, they literally make fat tissue get fatter because they drive sugar into it. Um, and that's kind of the, that's like at the nuts and bolts cellular level, that's what's happening. But it's not even like what's persuasive. The reason that that stuff, that we know that that stuff is behind the obesity problem is because scientists have also done these studies in dogs and cats where they feed the animal, both two groups of animals, exactly the same number of calories. They feed them both the exact same number of calories. And the only difference between the two diets is that one group gets more carbohydrate and less protein. And the other group gets more protein and less carbohydrate. Each gram of protein contains exactly the same number of calories as each gram of carbohydrate. They, they're both about four before you begin digestion. And so like, if you feed the exact same number of calories, you can just swap out the amount of protein for the amount of carbohydrate and end up giving the animal the exact same number of calories. That type of experiment's been done at least a half dozen times. Every single time that it's been done, the exact same thing happens, which is that the dogs, again, same exact number of calories, right. the ones that get more carbohydrate get fat, the ones that get more protein and less carbohydrate don't get as fat. And yeah. if you do it, if you turn the dial significantly, the results become really significant. Like the most kind of well-known and like uh, best conducted, best constructed and conducted study where there were like 40 beagle dogs and they gave them quite a different amount of carbohydrate. The basically the fat dogs, the carbohydrate eating dogs became six times, six times as fat. It was like, they, they gained something like 36% oh of the fat, like of fat tissue. It's like a huge wow. difference. So you also found out some really interesting facts about exercise and losing weight. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, basically, the main take home on the relationship between exercise and obesity when it comes to dogs is that it is exercise is a much less effective tool than dietary control when it comes to managing your dog's body composition. So there are and there are like kind of in a way of speaking two ways, two reasons why that's the case. In order to buy the first one, you've got to agree with my interpretation that feels like the only interpretation, but it's, it's mine, of the, <laughs> the record surrounding obesity, which is to say, it's not just about ca calories in and calories out. Carbohydrate is particularly fattening. If you buy that, and if you buy it in a serious way, then really that's the only thing that you care about. You can't exercise your way out of the problem. That's a, in my eyes, that's a very strong interpretation. I think that the carbohydrate is more fattening calorie for calorie than other things for dogs. And that you can't make a dog obese if you never give it cal, uh, carbohydrate, but that when it comes to losing weight, exercise plays a role. The second thing, at least as I see the world is that, and this is, this is tougher, much tougher to deny because it applies whether you buy calories in calories out or not, is it's just not very efficient that like the amount of calories, I run obscene amounts. And so I can eat a lot of carbohydrate because I run obscene amounts. Like, you know, I'll go on five hours today. Oh, and wow. like, you know, it over that period of time, I, I have a job where it allows me to do that. And it's like, I have time to do that. That's not something that like fits into the average dog owner's life. You know what I mean? What fits into the average dog owner's life is taking your dog for a walk or not, taking it out to play fetch or not. And basically, the, we've, the, the, the scientific community has very good tools for looking at how many calories dogs burn when they do those kinds of things, walking a mile or playing fetch for 20 minutes. And it just doesn't move the needle very much. You're talking about like the, the, the amount of the number of kibbles you have to take out of the dog's daily ration to make up to like have the same impact as a 30 minute walk every day is just negligible. It's just like, I mean, it's just like you can so much more easily just change the amount of food that the animal is eating or change the amount of carbohydrate that it's taking in. And it'll have a much more significant impact than, you know, if you're, there are plenty of folks 
who by virtue of their age or pre-existing medical conditions or their lifestyle, they can't take a dog for a six mile, seven mile walk every day. And that's the kind of volume you need to have that impact in any kind of realistic time frame. Something I'll note anecdotally is that like, I, my, so I've had a Rottweiler and a St. Bernard, neither of which does very well in the heat. So there are big chunks of their life, like, you know, Cody's life. Cody never went for a walk, basically. He's a fetch, loved to play fetch. And so we'd play fetch, but like almost never went for a walk. And Nash, almost the same. And like, they are rock solid. Like they're not, there's just, you don't certainly do not need exercise in order to stay lean. It is one way to get there. It's just very inefficient and you can get your dog there without it. Yeah. However, I believe that exercise is a fantastic thing for dogs. And there's a reason that I try to give my dogs, uh, there's two reasons why I try to give my dogs a bout of exercise every day or as much as I can. And they are one, they love it. Right. You know, it's like I try, if you exercise in a kind of way, if you're receptive, if you're tuned in to how your dog is, uh, reacting to the exercise, you can tell what they like. And there's some things they really like. Cody's life. Cody would choose the tennis ball over my welfare at any moment over his 14 year lifespan, every time, 10 out of 10 times. Like he yeah. just, that was the best part of his day, best <laughs> part of his life. And so I'm, I want to do it because it's what I want my dog to have fun. Right. And have a good life. And then the other thing is uh, surrounding basically muscle. Muscle is a, just like fat, the amount of muscle that's on like muscle tissue you have in your body is really impactful for health, for dogs, just like for people. And yeah. also for dogs, just like for people, once we reach a certain age, we begin to lose that muscle mass every day. Yeah. Less, you have less and less of it as a natural matter. And you have to actively do things in order to maintain it, let alone gain more. And so yeah. if you think just very roughly that fat is like poison and muscle is like medicine, you got to do the things you need to keep getting the medicine. And basically, very roughly speaking, there's only two, like you need to do exercise in order to make that happen. You need to do some form of resistance strength style exercise to build muscle. And right. so doing that for your dogs is, a, is a, a very helpful thing as well. And so finding something they like to do that has the quality of like imparting resistance. So either that's like, trying to speed up its big body when running after something, trying to accelerate that big body. That's a form of resistance or going yeah. up the hill, form of resistance, playing a tug games, a form of resistance, all that, th those types of things help to build muscle mass in one way or another and are therefore helpful. Yeah. I remember, um, losing weight and it, I think it was the first time that it kind of switched me off of that calories in calorie out mindset where I lost I think I had switched out like fat for muscle. And I think I lost two clothing sizes, but I didn't really lose any weight. Yeah, and exactly. I was like, wait a minute, this whole time I've been worrying about how much I weighed when I achieved the same goal with, yeah. with just by exercising and changing how I was eating, but the needle on the actual scale, I, I think it maybe changed a little bit, but it was not, it was not in proportion to what I had gained right. from right. that. And I know we have to wrap up here and I really want to talk, talk to you about what's coming up in the next episode. What, what I've tried, I mean, it's a jumble of information. So it's like, what I've tried to do so far is explain to folks what the scientific record says, what it says about exercise, what it says about carbohydrates, what it says about obesity, all that stuff. And that, that's part of the book is just like looking through all the studies, finding out what they all say. But the really interesting part of the story and what is actionable for pet owners is, okay, well, that's what it says. So what do we do with that? Yeah. Why, if that, you're telling me a bunch of stuff about the science, Dan, but it's stuff that my veterinarian disagrees with. And it's stuff I've never even heard before. Why is that? Why are you, what, why should I believe what you're saying? Why is that not getting taught more frequently? And what are the impacts for me? Is What does it mean about what I should feed my dog? What does it mean about how my dog ought to live? And that story is not about just like looking at studies and saying, you know, this study says this, this study says that. This, that's about me going into pet food factories, me having the like conversations with the folks who are teaching veterinary school to, to rising veterinarians, hearing the nonsense answers and walking through folks through like why that's just not mainstream. Why all the stuff I'm saying is not just common sense mainstream stuff at this point. In this day and age, everybody wants to make the best decision they can for their dog. They all want to get their, we all love our dogs, undoubtedly. 
We oh all gosh. have good resources that we're willing to devote to them, undoubtedly. We're all smart enough, undoubtedly. And they're incredibly unhealthy, which makes no sense. We're all really motivated to do it. And it's just a question of understanding what it is. Like why, what, what, what do we have to really do? What should I care about as a pet owner when I'm shopping for a pet food? What really has an impact on the animal's health and what's just marketing fluff or like misleading? Um, oh my gosh, yes. I mean, you walk in world. and you're overwhelmed. You think you know, you think you listen to a podcast and you're like, okay, I'm going to go do this. And you walk into these stores and it's overwhelming. And I think yeah. the information you're going to give people, take it even for, it, it's going to be stuff that they haven't heard before. So I'm really excited. Yeah, I know. Yeah, well. <laughs> Thank you guys for being here today. Please make sure you join us in the next episode where we will continue the conversation about dogs, dog food, and dogma. All of the links we discussed in the program today are below. If you have liked this episode, please hit the like button. If you haven't already, please subscribe. Stay happy. Mm -hmm.